We're in part two of a series called More Blessed. And as I mentioned last week for those who are here, is this series could not have come at a better time. Because for those who are just kind of tuning in right here, haven't been following, we just finished up a series, the last series, which was called, What Do You Do When There's Nothing You Can Do? And it was all about how God is with us in our trials and tribulations and those tough times. And what better after a series about trials than a series about God's blessing? And that's why when I say we're going to talk about blessed and not just blessed, but more blessed, it's like, yes, that's exactly what we need. Because as we talked about last week, yes, he is God of the trials and yes, he is God of the tribulation, but absolutely positively, he's a father who loves to bless his children. And what we're talking about in this series is not how to be blessed because we're already blessed. We're talking about how to be more blessed. Exactly. Because he's already given us so much and he's already blessed us with so much. But the goal is, as you pray in your prayers like I pray in my prayers, God, you've blessed my family, please bless my family more. Anyone who doesn't say that? God, you've blessed my health, please bless it more. God, you've blessed my, my, my past, please bless my future. Bless my finances. Bless my life. Bless my career. Bless my plans. All of us don't want just blessing. We want more blessing. And the good news for us is that Jesus gives us a formula. He gives us a very clear and specific formula. We've been blessed with so much, but I feel bad. Like, is it okay to ask for more? When Jesus says, yes, it's okay to ask for more. And I'll tell you exactly how to get more blessing in your life. Our theme verse, Acts 20, verse 35. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to, say it with me, to give than to receive. To which everyone said, oh, that's not what I was hoping for. I was hoping for, it is more blessed to believe than not believe. Because I believe, so I want that to be the path. Or wouldn't it be great if it was more blessed to go to church than not go to church? I'm already here. I might as well get something extra out of it. Like, I'm already here. Or it's more, more, more blessed to ask than I'll ask. That's, I, I mean, I do that all the time. I ask nonstop for God to give me blessing. But that's not what he says. He says, you've been blessed, you've been blessed. You want more blessing? I said, yes, I want more blessing. You want more blessing? Yes. If I asked you in the beginning, who wants more blessing? You'd raise a hand. If I said, who wants more, more? You'd raise both hands and feet and everything that you could raise. Because every one of us, bless, bless, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, lo the matanya, forgive me, say the blessing. That's what we want. Bless, bless, bless. I'm making it up. Jesus said, there is a path to more blessing. It's not a secret. It's not a mystery. There's nothing hidden. If you want blessing, you give. If you want more blessing, you give more. Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. And believe it or not, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, the majority of his teaching was actually on this subject. He spoke about giving more than any other subject. More promises that God makes are about sacrificing and giving than anything else. Half of the parables, if you go through the parables that Jesus gave... 50% of them are on the subject of giving. And in case you don't believe me, you think I'm making this stuff up. Do a Google search when you go home. In the New Testament, the word believe, believe, or some derivative of believe, is written 272 times. Believe, 272. The word pray, 371. The word love, very important. 714 times the word love. The word give, 2,162. So you add up all the believes and all the praise and all the loves, still doesn't get you to all the times that, that the New Testament spoke about giving because it is the very heart of the gospel. And the reason why. Okay, why is it more blessed to give than to receive? I'm a logical person, so I, I, I want to like, get like an answer. I don't want to just take it on faith and just, why is it? Why is it that giving leads to more blessing? A life of giving leads to a life of blessing. Well, this is very easy. We saw this last week. It's because a life of blessing comes from a life of giving. That's kind of our key thought for the series. But why? Because a life of giving is the life of Jesus. The reason why it is more blessed to give than to receive is very simple. It's not because, okay, follow me here, okay, on the logic one. It's not God saying, if you do that, if you give, I will bless you. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, if you give, I will bless you. That's not. It's saying, if you, think about it this way. 
If you stand in this chair, if you stand in this chair, that's the chair that I'm going to stand in. That's what Jesus is saying. Okay? So I'm standing in that chair. Maybe let's make it a room. Maybe not a chair. Chair's a little awkward because it's kind of cozy. Let's say this room. I'm going to stand in this room. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to stand in this room. And if you want to stand in this room, like if I told you Jesus is in that room back there, would you go back in that room? You would say that's the blessed room because Jesus is in it. So if Jesus is standing in the room and you stand in the same room, you will be blessed. Not because he's giving you a blessing, because you chose to stand in the blessed room. Does this make sense? Well, there's a lot of things about Jesus that we can discuss and we can debate and his view, whatever it may be, but there's one thing that's undeniable, that Jesus stood in a room called giving and sacrifice. Jesus never stood in a room called accumulate for self. He never stood in that room. So if there's a room that's called me, 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 gimme, 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 Jesus will never stand in that room. So you can stand in that room if you want. No one's stopping you. The door is open. But you will not be blessed. Because the blessed room is where the blessed one is standing, and where the blessed one is standing is in a room called giving and sacrifice. That's why we say this. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I told you a verse that means a lot to me. It was read on the day that I was ordained as a priest. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man did not come to accumulate. He did not come to receive. He had everything. He gave it all up. Why? So that he could come here and give it to us. So if you want to be blessed, you stand in that room. If you want to not be blessed, don't stand in that room. You've heard the expression WWJD, what would Jesus do? Okay, we've all heard that before, which is good, and I, I'm all for it, like, more power to it. But the problem is sometimes what would Jesus do is hard to, like, correlate Jesus to me. Because, like, Jesus lived in the first century. I live in the 21st century. He was a carpenter. I'm a consultant. Like, it's, it's not always... So I, I, I say it a little bit differently. Instead of what would Jesus do, Jesus was never... Jesus never had my income. So what, I, ask yourself a better question. What would Jesus do if he were in my shoes? What would Jesus do if he had what I have? What would Jesus do if he lived where I live? So if Jesus had, okay, Jesus was a carpenter, made nothing. If Jesus had my income, what do you think he'd do with it? I don't know the answer to that. Like, I'm not telling you. I don't, first of all, I don't know how much you make. I don't know how much I make. What would Jesus do if he had my income? What would Jesus do if he was blessed with a support network around him the way I'm blessed with a support network around me? What would Jesus do if he had everything that I have? What would he do if he was in health like me and he's in shape like me and he's been, like, what would he do? I don't know the answer. But that's the question that all of us need to ask because the answer to that question, this is very important, the answer to that question is how to be more blessed. The answer to that question is how to be more blessed. What would Jesus do if he heard about foster care? Okay, that we just heard about earlier today. That's the question. What we say in the divine liturgy, okay, we just said a little bit ago, we said that he instituted for us this great mystery of godliness, talking about the Eucharist. He instituted for us this great mystery of godliness for being determined to give. Determined to give himself up to death for the life of the world. So, in this series... How to live a more blessed life? Life of blessing comes from life of giving. Why? Because life of giving is life of Jesus. Last week, we kind of introduced the topic. If you missed it, go online, get caught up. Today, we're going to go to the next step, and we're going to talk about a second kind of mindset shift in this idea of giving. Told you, this series is not a practical series. As, we're not trying to change actions. This is not like a pass the collection plate around kind of a series. This has nothing to do with that. This has nothing to do with the churches in need. We can't pay the bills. There's nothing like that. This is a mindset shift. The second mindset shift is going to be based on this verse, Luke chapter 16, verse 10 and 11. It says this. It says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. He explains it in the next verse. He says, So therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, meaning worldly wealth, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Saying, very simple, like this is not a complicated verse. You got two kids. He's faithful in what is least, he's made ruler over much, okay? 
You got two kids. You give them each a dollar. Dollars probably not in today's ten dollars. Okay, inflation. Okay, when we were kids, it would have been a dollar. Today, ten dollars. You give a kid a dollar today, he's gonna you know throw it away. Whatever, he's not gonna know what to do with it. You give two kids ten dollars. You got a boy here and a boy here. You give them each ten dollars. One of them uses that ten dollars, maybe like invests two dollars, puts a dollar in the church basket, uses the other money like save a little bit, and then do something to help someone else. That's how he does it. The second guy rips it up, and flushes it down the toilet. And then you got another $10. Who are you going to give it to? Like, is this, this is not complicated. This is not rocket science. He who is faithful in what is least is, is faithful in much. You, instead of the, 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 the dollar, your kids are older. You get them each a used car when they start driving. One of them takes care, changes the oil, Makes ne make, never, make sure it never goes below 40% in the gas. You never go below 40% in the gas. Once you hit 40, you start looking for the gas station. Why would you go any lower than that? It takes the same amount of time. That's just it's a personal thing. He washes it. He cleans it. Takes care of it. The other one, it's like bumper cars, okay? Bumping into garages, bumping into other cars, bumping into poles. And then all of a sudden, you want to buy a new car. What are you going to buy a new car for? Are you going to think about it for more than a second? The one who is faithful with the, the stinky car is the one who's going to get the new car. Or as a father, filled with wisdom, and you want to impart that wisdom to your children, and you have one child who's like, tell me more, dad, tell me more. And another child is, ah, oh, and the moaning and the groaning and the, then no wisdom for you, okay? All my wisdom will be imparted to the one who sees the value. <laughs> because the principle is simple. The more we're faithful with little things, the more we're ready for big things. Does anybody disagree with this concept? Is this, is this difficult? Like, this is logic. The more we're faithful with little things, the more we're ready for big things. But if we waste the little things, and we squander the little things. And we're reckless with the little things. Then we may never receive the big things. Ready for our key thought today? Today, right now as we speak, in this moment, God is using earthly riches to test my readiness for heavenly blessings. Right now as we speak, God is using earthly riches to test my readiness for heavenly blessings. Right now, God has given to us more than we deserve. Every one of us has more than we deserve. And he's giving it to us to see what we're going to do with it. And if we're faithful and we do a good job with it, he's going to give us more and greater. Now listen carefully to me. When I say he's going to give us more, I'm not saying he's going to give us more money. That's what we want. But that's because we're not smart. Because of all the blessings, God has blessings, okay, storehouses, Costco-sized warehouses of blessing. Like, there's no shortage. He's got all kinds of shelves and stockpiles of blessing after blessing after blessing. And the cheap stuff by the register, the cheap stuff, the stuff that's like, yeah, you can have one of those. That's money. That's the financial. That's the cheapest of them all. That's like when there's like, okay, we're sold out of like joy and peace. Okay, just take some of the money. That's the cheap stuff. No one cares about that stuff. That's the lowest of them all. So God may bless you financially. I'm not saying he, I believe he already has blessed us more. But my point is, I'm not saying you are generous and God will give you more money. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the money is the cheap stuff. The real deal is the heavenly stuff. The stuff that can't be measured in a bank account. So what I'm saying is this, maybe, you know how we complain that God doesn't bless us enough? You know how we complain that God doesn't give to, like we all complain. We may not say it out loud, but we complain. God bless me and bless this and bless and bless. Maybe the shortage on the blessing in my life isn't God's fault after all. Based on this, maybe the shortage of the blessing is not God's angry at me or God is unfair, or God doesn't care. That's what we think. God, if you cared, you'd give me. 
God, if you loved me, you'd give me. Maybe that's not the answer. Maybe it's based on what I'm doing with the blessing that he's already given me. Last week, we saw a little boy. The mascot of this series, a little boy with the five loaves and the two fish. And we saw that little boy. And he was blessed abundantly. And we said that he had a little bit in his hand. He gave it in the hands of Jesus. And anything given to Jesus will be blessed. And we said there were probably, we don't know. But there had to have been somebody else in the crowd who had some food. Like they said there was 5,000 men plus women and children. That's 20,000 people. And not one of them had any other food. Like come on. Like when we were kids, like these are Middle Eastern people. Okay, every day, take food everywhere they go. Like I used to, my mom used to pack me a lunch to go get the mail. Are you telling me that nobody else had food? But I think everybody else is like, no, 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 there's, no, 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 here. Just, they held on to their food. So Jesus is like, okay, if you want to hold on to your food, you can hold on to your food. That's up to you. But it can't be blessed. I can't bless it unless you give it to me. So this boy gave, it was blessed. This boy held on, it was not blessed. No one's angry. No one's upset at you. But don't ask me to bless what you're holding on to so tightly. Does this make sense? Like it's logic. So maybe the shortfall of blessing isn't on God. Maybe it's on me because I'm not using my earthly riches in a way that makes me blessable. To which you might respond, which every one of us would respond, okay, I know exactly what you're thinking, but I'm not rich. But I'm not rich. If we took a survey, and we won't, but if we took a survey, how many people think they're rich? Most people would not put their hands up. And then if I said to you, how many people think someone else is rich? Everyone would put their hands up. Two, two thoughts on that. Number one, the amount doesn't matter. Because the little boy last week was blessed with five loaves and two fish. Happy meal from McDonald's. So if you got $3.99 in your pocket, you got enough to be blessed. So it's not a matter of the quantity. It's a matter of the willingness to let go. Remember last week I said that maybe it's what you're holding back that's holding you back. It's what you're holding back that's holding you back. That was kind of last week. But what I want to talk about for a little bit right here is maybe, secondly, we need to reevaluate what it means to be rich. Because I would say that there, I would guarantee that there are people that you know, maybe here amongst us right now, that would look at your life and say, I wish I had what you had. You disagree with that? There are people here today, and there are people who are outside who would look at you and say, you're rich. I wish I had what you had. And I'll make it even more. I'll prove it even more. If you go back in time, I guarantee you, there was a time in your life where you looked at it and said, if I ever get to that point, I'll be rich. And many of us have gotten to that point and surpassed that point. I remember when I was in college. My first job when I was in college, my second year of college, I worked at a grocery store called Super Fresh. I remember Super Fresh. This was like back in the day. You got to be old. I don't think they still exist anymore. I think it was a derivative of A&P or something like that. At Super Fresh. This was the best job I ever had in my life. Other than this job. Okay, but that. I loved it. Okay, because I like to stay on my feet. I'm kind of an active guy. I was unloading the dairy trucks. I loved it so much. I still, to this day, no joke, I have my gloves and my box cutter, okay, that I had back then. I would, I just loved it so much about getting in there and rolling up the sleeve and, you know, and then talking with the other employees and complaining about our back and our neck. And I didn't have any back, but I was just complaining or whatever it is. So I loved it. And then there's rules about, like, things that get broken or get dropped and, like, who can eat them after because they can't sell them. So, like, we would drop some, but whatever it was. I was making $11 an hour. And I remember thinking to myself, man, $11 is like good, but man, Vilma, her name was Vilma, the cashier, Vilma, man, she, if she was making $28,000 per year. And I remember thinking to myself, man, if I ever get to where Vilma is, I'll have made it. Not as a career, but I'm saying like, I, I would have loved to have made $28,000 a year. I think that's so much money. And then I got to my fourth year and I graduated, or before I graduated, I got a job as a consultant and I was offered $39,000 per year, which is more than 11 and way more than 28 as well. And I should have been ecstatic. 39, that's a lot of money from 11 and passing the 28. But the problem is I knew other people who were making more. So then all of a sudden, 39 didn't satisfy me. 
And I remember even some of my roommates were like, you know what, you should ask for more because you're supposed to like negotiate whatever it was. So I'm like, that's not really my personality. They're like, no, you should ask more, ask more. So I've called the lady on the phone and I'm like, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I, 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 I think, you know, you offer me 39, that's very nice, but I think, you know, that I can get to, you know, 42 or something like that. And she's like, well, we really thought about our offer. And I'm like, fine, I'll take it, please, don't take it. I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. Just don't send me back to the $11. Like, I'll take it, I'll take it. And I remember making 39,000. And I said, you know what? One day I'll crack that 40. And if I can ever get to 45, 40, I will have it made at 45. That was what I thought. And I started working, started getting a raise. And I'm approaching 45 and I'm about to hit it. Then all of a sudden, I start dating Marianne. And now all of a sudden, 45 is nothing anymore. Because now all of a sudden, I got to start going out places. Okay, you got to start going to eat at places where you can't order by the number, the combo meal. Like, you got to go to places where you sit down. And then all of a sudden, I started thinking about rings. And I started thinking about houses and things like that. So it's like, I passed 45, and I'm like, this is nothing. I'm a poor man right now. That's what happens. What you defined as rich, what happens as you get closer, it moves. It moves. It moves. Then eventually, we got married and we had kids. Then all of a sudden, rich is outer space. Never could never be seen again. <laughs> the point here, follow me on this one. Follow me on this one. Our definition of rich isn't based on what we have, but rather on what we wish we had. Our definition of rich isn't based on what we have, but it's based on what we wish we have. And the problem is that's a moving target. That keeps on going. So regardless of what I have, I never feel rich because I always want more. I always want more. Well, let's do a little world survey here. Okay, let's travel the world and let's ask people around the world, what does it mean to be rich? I, got, I did a, a mission trip one time to, to Kenya. Okay, way back, uh, several mission trips. My, I remember my first one, we went to some of the poorest areas, the villages. And people in Kenya, I remember, we would visit, I can't remember the name of the little town. It's, it's, like, it's one of the, like, the biggest slums in the, in the world. This little box right here that I'm up here, all right, this would be, a house for five, a family of five or six, easily. And bedroom, bathroom, like everything is right there. There's no electricity, there's no water. It's just, it's just, just dirt floor and walls. That's it. And you would go to those people and you would say to them, what's it mean to be rich? And they would say something like the following. They'd say, I hear, I hear that in America, people have homes that have many rooms. And they have so many rooms that they even, they have cars, and they have so many rooms in their house, so many that they even have a room for their car to sleep in. So I'm thinking like, what? And what are they talking about? A garage. And I'm telling you that those people would say, if you only had the garage in your house, if you only had a one-car garage, you're rich. If you had a two-car garage, you're loaded. If it's got electricity, it's something you've got the three-car garage with the windows and the whatever it may be, and the heated and the air conditioning, and that nice floor where you don't get your shoes dirty. They're so rich that they have a house, a car, and a house for their car. If you go to Calcutta, some places where people die in of starvation in the street, you just walk by, I've never been there, but you say, you just find people in the street who are just dead from starvation, they don't have any food. They would say to you that there are some people, I hear about them, that are so rich that they have rooms and rooms and rooms in their house with boxes of food, packages of food, boxes, so many boxes of food that they had to get a separate room, which we would call a pantry. And these people have enough food that they could feed our village for a week with just the food in this room. Let's go even closer. You could go to people in the streets here Okay, again, I'm not familiar with Loudoun County. I'm sure there's places, I, but I know in D.C. You go to places of people in D.C. who have nothing. And they will tell you that there are people who are so rich. Can you imagine there are people who are so rich who have closets full of clothes and walk out of there and say, I have nothing to wear. Can you imagine people that rich? Like, let's just be honest. We're rich. That's not embarrassing. Like, don't be embarrassed to say you're rich. Look at here, this is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Like, it's nothing wrong to say I'm rich. It's not, like, if someone said, like, God blessed you with a great wife, I'd be like, no, 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 no. 
not really. I got her on sale. Like, <laughs> no. I say, yeah, I have the best wife on the planet. I'm not embarrassed to say that. She's the best wife, but I'm the smartest because I chose her. So, I mean, I'm not embarrassed to say that God has blessed me with riches. I'm not embarrassed to say it. It's not, a ma- it's not bad that you're rich. It's, it's what you do with it. It's how you live with it. And I remember someone told me one time, they said, living rich is not a sin, but dying rich, that's a different story. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with being blessed financially as long as we realize it's given to us as a test. If you pass the test, you will be more blessed. But if you fail the test, at some point, the blessing goes. The blessing is taken away. And you say, but wait a minute, that's still... I'm going to show you a parable from the scripture, because like I told you, half of the parables that Jesus gave were actually on this subject. We're going to see a parable about a guy who was blessed abundantly. He did not pass the test. He did not do, use it in the right way. And even what he had was eventually taken away from him. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 19. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Who's a rich person? I'm a rich person. You and I are rich people. So we're going to read this not as about Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. This is not a parable for those two people. It's a parable for all of us. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, when you're rich, you speak to yourself in the third person. Soul, you have many good deeds, many goods laid up for you many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This parable, what he does right here, let's call this the American dream. Because this is what we all live for. This is why we work hard. This is why we're on call on weekends. This is why we skip church every now and then because we just got to put in some extra hours. This is why we miss our kids' baseball games. This is why we say we don't have time for this right now because we're working hard, working hard, working hard, and then we get to this point, and now it's all worth it. This is when you get to the point, it's all worth it. I worked hard. Now I can retire early. I can enjoy everything that I've done all these past years. This is why we do it. Now it's time to live the good life. This is how you fail the richest test. You know why? Because he thought how to fail is to believe that more is always for me. God blessed me and gave me and so much and build bigger and, 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 and. Now I can enjoy it. God gave me all that, obviously, because he wants me to enjoy it. And he wants me to live an easy life. And he wants me to retire early. And he wants me to take a lot of vacations. We would never think that. Just a question to think about, and there's no judgment right here, okay? The world has really messed up how we view so many things in life, and our view towards riches and finances and possessions and prosperity is very distorted, very distorted in the world that we live in today. Let me ask you a question. If today you find out, or tomorrow you go to work, you find out that your income goes up by X amount, whatever the amount is, I don't know, 10%, whatever, make up a number, $1,000, you find out, you got a bonus, you got a bonus check, thousand dollars what is your first thought and i'm not judging but most of us if we're honest is our thought oh that's great because now i can buy this now i can afford this now i can get that new phone that upgrade now i can buy that new outfit that i wanted now i can go on that vacation now i can me 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 that's how most of us think i got this bit of extra it must be for my sake now i can go spend more on myself That's what this guy thought. And Jesus' response to him is, you failed the test. Story goes on, verse 20 and 21. God said to him, fool, fool, you thought it was all for you? Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things, then whose will those things be which you ever provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Oh my goodness. American dream, whole life to get to this point. And God said, okay. You you failed. This night your soul is required. Bravo. You did a good job. You had so much blessing in life. That's us. Blessed beyond belief. Like this guy was a farmer who was blessed by God. And of all all the careers in the world, 
The one that requires the blessing of God to be rich is farmer. Because you can do all you want, but if there's no sun, there's no sun. If there's no rain, there's no rain. So God was not against this guy being rich. So I want you to be very, very clear. God is not angry at the guy for being rich. God is like, guy, I made you rich. Guy, I'm the one who blessed your crops. I'm the one who gave you everything. But I was giving it to you for a purpose, as a test, to see what you would do with it. And all you said is, thank you, more for me, more for me, more for me, okay. F, minus, F minus, minus. Because this, me, all for me, back to what I said earlier, this is the opposite of how Jesus lived. There's nothing more opposite of Jesus' life than this. That you give me more, good, more for me. Give me that, okay, now I can have. Cannot be blessed when you're living a life that's directly opposed to how Jesus lived. So what should he have done? What do you think he should have done with his more riches? What would you do if you were a parent, a father, a mother, and you invested more in a child? And you have several children, but you see this right here, and you continue to invest and invest. What do you want him to do with that more investment? What would you do if, as a priest, okay, you see a congregation of, of, of different kinds of people and you investing in one and investing in one, what do you want that one to do with the extra investment? That make it very easy for you. What do you want, you want, for those Warren Buffetts and Bill Gates people to do in the world? The people who have been given so much, what do you wish that they would do with all the extra they've been given? You say the exact same thing that God would say. Is I want, it's a universal rule is that I give you more so that you can share it. 1 Timothy tells us exactly what to do. St. Paul says, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age. Who's rich in this present age? I'm rich. You're rich. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Don't be embarrassed. God gives us richly. But let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, not just rich in money, rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Said another way, how to pass the test is to believe that I receive more in order to give more. That's what I want for my children. That's what I want for my congregation. That's what I want from those rich people who have billions and billions of dollars while so many people are poor. I want them to receive more so that they would give more. And if they do, then I'll be the first one saying, give more to them, give more to them. Don't give it to me, give it to them. Because I know that the more you give to them, the more they give to others, give them. Bless. I will be praying for them. Please, God, bless them more. And so will you. Because God gives us riches, earthly riches, to test us for heavenly blessings, our readiness. And the way that you fail, believe it's all for me. The way that you pass is believe that I receive more in order to give more. He blesses me, so I give more. And then I give more, he blesses me more. So then I give more, so then he blesses me more. And it's a cycle. It's a cycle that continues on and on and on and on. That's why, again, Jesus is the blessed one, the most blessed, because he was the most sacrificed and the most giving. <clears throat> when you believe that it's all for you, you limit the amount of blessing that God's going to pour into your life. But when you are ready to share, ready to give, then you open the door to God's blessing in your life. Now, I told you this is not practical. This really, I'm ta talking about a mindset shift. But I can't leave you without something practical. In case you say, okay, what, what, tell me one thing that I can do. I'm going to give you something very actionable that you can do. And I promise you, I promise you, money back guarantee. Get it? Money back, okay? Money back guarantee. I promise you, if you do this, God will work in your life. I promise you, if you do this, God will work in your life. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Create margin. Ask God how to use it. Create margin. Ask God how to use it. Let me break down what that means. First of all, what does margin mean? Margin means the difference between what I have and what I spend. And by the way, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about money and time. As I said last week, those are the two commodities that are the most valuable. I would argue time is more valuable because I can never get more time. But anyway, time and money. Create margin, meaning this is what I have, this is what I use. The difference is called margin. So for example, 
if my income is $10,000 per month and I spend $10,000 a month, then I have how much margin? Zero. But if I spend $9,000 a month, I have how much margin? $1,000. Now here's the thing, listen carefully. The amount of money that you have has nothing to do with how rich or poor you feel. It has nothing to do with it. It's the amount of margin you have. And I'll prove it to you. Again, you make $10,000 a month. You have, let's say two people make $10,000 a month. One spends $9,000 a month. One spends $11,000 a month. Because it's America. God bless America. You don't need to, you can spend more than you make. Okay? So if I make 10, but I spend 11, how do I feel? Poor. I don't have enough. I need more money. I'm poor. No, you're rich, man. No, I'm, I'm a thousand short every month. I'm, I'm, versus this guy, he feels rich. I walk away every month with a thousand bucks. It doesn't matter how much you make. It matters how much margin you have. The guy with the margin feels rich. The guy without the margin feels poor. We feel poor not because we don't make enough, but sorry to say, because we spend all that we make and sorry to say we spend more than we make. That's why we're like, I'm not rich. I don't have. Look, pocket's empty. Pocket's empty. But again, by world standards, we're rich. Some statistics, you can go to different websites, you can confirm or deny, like different websites say differently. But you know, if you make an income of $45,000 per year, you're in the top 3% of world population income. $45,000 a year, top 3%. If you make $58,000, you're in the top 1.9% of people across the world as far as your income. Now, if you spend that entire 58, you're never going to feel rich. But the bottom line is, you've been given more. What you do with it makes you feel rich or poor. Same thing with time. I said it's not just money, it's time. We all have been given the same amount of time. But if you waste all your time and you do fruitless activities, scrolling social media, click after click on YouTube, then all of a sudden you're like, I don't have enough time. I'm poor in time. I don't have time to pray. I wish I could spend more time with my daughter, but I don't have any time. I don't have time to go to church. Like, I, I don't have time. No, you have the same amount of time as everybody else. And nobody had more or less. It's how you spend it. If you choose to cut those things out, then all of a sudden you're going to see, I'm rich. And that's what I'm challenging you to do. Create margin in your time and in your money. Create margin. The one who creates margin, I promise you, will feel rich instantly. So you go home to start financial. You go home today. You sit with your wife or your husband. You look at your budget. Hopefully you have a budget. If you don't have a budget, get a budget. You look at your budget and you say, we spend this amount. What can we do to decrease what we spend? Of course, it'd be great if you can go into your boss's office and demand an extra money, but that's not realistic. What can I do to decrease my spending? I'm just going to make up a number, but whatever number you want. What can I do to decrease my spending $500 a month? $500 a month or $100 or $200, whatever number. I'm just making up numbers. What can I do to decrease my spending $500 a month? And then once you do that, you take that $500. You don't have any plans for it. You say, God, what do you want me to do with that $500? What do you want me to do with that $500? And you wait, and I promise you God will answer. I promise you God will answer. But you first, your job is to create the margin and then let him tell you how to, what to do with it. In case you're wondering, what does that mean to create margin? How do I spend less? It's very simple. Let me give you the key to spending less. Spend less. It's very easy. Don't upgrade your phone. The one in your pocket works. You got you to church today, you, like it works. Don't upgrade your phone. Don't, like go to the store, see the shoes and say no to that 14th pair of shoes that looks exactly like all the other 13 pair that you have exactly like them. Just say no. Say no. Create that margin. Let me tell you one. This is a hard one. Drink the free coffee. At work or at church. Drink the free one. Don't go out for coffee. Drink the free one. You know the stuff that they give to the rats, okay? The free coffee. You don't need to buy the specialty with the creamers and the whatever it may be. Drink the free coffee. Create margin and ask God what you want me to do with it. And I promise you, I promise you, he will bless you through that. I promise you. How about your time? I know a person. You know the concept of tithe is 10%. So this person said that God wants us to tithe our finances 10%, but also our time. So a person told me, this is not me, this is somebody else, said, 
there are 52 weeks per year. So there are 52 weekends per year. So he said he's going to tithe five weekends per year. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, very simple. He said, I'm just going to set aside five weekends per year, spread them out, and I'm just going to pray. So, you know, November 3rd weekend, I'm just going to pray and say, God, this weekend belongs to you. You tell me what you want me to do with it. And I'll do whatever it is that you want. And I'm telling you, uh, like, you tell me. You don't think God's going to bless this person? You don't think God's going to abundantly pour himself into this person? As this person says, this weekend is for you. You tell me what you want me to do. You tell me where you want me to go. You tell me who you want me to help. You think that God's going to be like, nice try. Like, you think that? After that? We're all blessed by God. We're all blessed by God. If you ignore everything that I said today, you are blessed by God. But this series is not how to be blessed. It's about how to be more blessed. And more blessed is by giving. Last thing I want to say. No margin means no giving. No giving means no blessing. The reason we need to go home and create some margin today is not the work for the sake of the work. The reason we create margin in our time and our finances is so that we can give it. We can sacrifice it. And the reason that we give it and sacrifice is because in the end, we want more from God. So it's really not as selfless as we make it out to be. It's really not giving. It's really receiving. It's a trade. Remember back when we were in school and there was that kid who wasn't very sharp and you would say, I'll take your pudding and I'll give you this fresh banana. Remember that kid who would trade the pudding for the banana? Like the real sugar for the fake sugar? Like, you remember that guy? That's kind of what we're doing. We're saying, God, you've given me earthly riches and it's hard to let go. Like, let's be honest. It's hard to let go because we see the bills and the inflation. We know, and there's, we know it's hard. But like that little boy with the five loaves and two fish, I'm going to let go of it. I'm going to give it. And I don't know where I'm going to eat. I don't know how I'm going to eat my lunch today. But I'm going to give it. And I'm going to trust that I'm not giving, I'm not flushing it down the toilet. I'm giving it into the hands of the one who holds all blessings in the palm of his hand. And I'm going to trust that no matter what I give, I will never outgive God. My prayer for you and I is that we learn to live the way Jesus lived in every aspect. That we have faith the way Jesus had faith. We have love the way Jesus loved. That we are kind and forgiving and compassionate the way Jesus was. But also that we are giving and sacrificing the way Jesus was as well. And when we do that, we will find that it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. And I promise you, I promise you, again, as a parent, all parents get this, okay? And I'm done, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. God's desire to bless you is greater than your desire even to be blessed. I, as a dad, have bigger and better, like whatever my kids want from me is nothing compared to what I want to give them. And I promise you, God is the same for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to give to us. But the path to get there, he gives us earthly blessings to see, to test our readiness for the heavenly ones to come. And my prayer is that we would always remember that, that when we see our earthly riches, again, our time, our money, whatever it is, we realize it's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test. And I don't want to fail this test. I want to use this and pass this test and prove that when I'm faithful with what's least, that I will be faithful also in much, and he will give me the greater riches. Let's stand together for a prayer. Not quite yet. Thank you. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, truly, there's no words to thank you for all that you've poured into us and given us and all the blessing that we have. None of us can say, Lord, that we aren't blessed abundantly, but we want more blessing. And we know that the path to get there, Lord, is the more giving. So please, Lord, please help us to create margin in our lives with our time and with our money. And then, Lord, with that, you guide us in what direction you want us to go with it. Give us the, the faith to, to be able to do that, Lord, because sometimes it's scary. It's a scary thought. But we trust you, Lord, and we know that you are the source of all goodness and all blessing. And we know, Lord, that you desire, your desire to give to us is greater than anything we can imagine. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday.